hello and welcome uh, to another Bible study here um, in the online version at Oregon Lutheran Church. Um, I want to pick up kind of where we left off uh, the last kind of two-part thing of talking about um, something really kind of specific and building on the things that we had done before up until this point. What we had been building on is looking at the scriptures themselves, how they developed and everything, and how we can best um, interpret them to get back to the, the meaning that is intended by them, essentially getting back to the truth of God or the Word of God that's in them and not misreading them because of a lack of understanding the context in which they were written. Essentially doing all of that, we are reading the scriptures and bringing out the intended meaning and then contextualizing it for ourselves. And by contextualizing it, we mean we're just allowing ourselves to understand it in our context, modern context, uh, American context for us specifically, um, and doing that so that we get the same meaning that the original readers got and the same meaning that is in the text and intended for us to use to build our lives upon and use those truths in scripture to be um, the source and norm of our faith and, and how we rule our lives and how we go about our day-to-day -day lives, um, both individually and as a church. Um, then the last time we had the, the two-part um, section that we looked at uh, the Gospel of John and how he is contextualizing um, the, the Gospel message for the Romans and the Greeks and how that kind of contextualization of the gospel message happens even as early as within the, the writing of the scriptures themselves, and therefore we need to be making sure that we're taking into account our audience and telling them the good news in, in the language and the wording and the um, understanding that they have so that they hear the gospel and it is good news for them. Um, I want to build on the same type of themes of being able to contextualize the scriptures and bring out the true meanings of them. Um, but I also want to touch on some of the things that are obviously uh, in the forefront of our lives right now. Um, we're all in the middle of the quarantine and dealing with the coronavirus, and on top of that we had all of the things that happened um, starting in Minneapolis and some of the outrage that we have um, in, in different parts of the country now and, and things that have descended from um, bringing out uh, social injustice and, and started there and are descending into rioting and looting and all that kind of uh, terrible things that we don't want to see happen. And it seems like a very divisive time and it seems like something that is very it might seem new to us or, or uh, specifically terrible or worse than the past, um, but it's, it's things that we actually have seen before, even if it happened before our lifetime, and that's not to downplay the significance of what is happening now, um, but we need to be able to, as a church, understand what the scriptures are saying about these types of things, and I think the best way to do that is to uh, look into what we'll, we'll do for the next uh, little bit here. For those who have been in Sunday school before the quarantine and the social distancing, um, for those who've um, been in the Sunday school that I've been teaching, or for those that have been at Bible study, you know that I've focused on Revelation a little bit. And what I want to do is really um, start with talking about a good approach to the book of Revelation that helps us do all the things we've talked about and getting back to the original meaning of it. Um, so we'll start talking a little bit in general about the book of Revelation because I think there is a specific way um, that some folks are approaching the book that helps us to clear up the confusion about it and it helps us to get back to the intended meaning of the book and I, and I think we'll find that as the last book in the New Testament, the last book written um, with the, the end of, of all things being the subject and the things that it actually says, those things are missed a lot of times by us. So essentially for what we're dealing with now as a country and as a, you know, a local community, all the things that we're seeing that are, are, are tough to deal with, the book of Revelation is probably one of the best things we can look to for comfort and guidance yet it's a very misunderstood book, and so if we can clear up some of the confusion and misunderstandings about it, then 
it, it can go from something that's confusing that we don't utilize as a tool for us and we can change it into another book which is the Word of God and therefore functions the way the Word of God should in our lives that we've talked about, a source and norm of our faith and a, a, a measuring rod, a guidance for us and something that we can build our lives upon, make decisions based off of, and for a large part we don't do that with Revelation because it's confusing and, and misunderstood. So that's where we're going to start today, and this will probably be um, the next couple of Bible studies um, until I, I feel like we've really kind of fleshed out some of these ideas. So we'll start with the introduction um, to that here today. Um, again, Revelation is uh, probably the most um, misunderstood book of Scripture. And there are a couple of key reasons for that that we, we actually can point out, and I would like to do that. Um, even though it's misunderstood, it is scripture, so it should function the same way the rest of the books do, which we try to do our best to allow them to by understanding the context and the inherent meaning um, that's in them. So I want to uh, just point out what is difficult about Revelation and, and, and bring out some points based on that, which will help us to um, approach it in a certain way and interpret it in a certain way based on some of the facts that we have. And so what we really are trying to do with all the contextualization things um, that, that we do to practice and to, to read scriptures in light of, uh, what we're trying to do is, is get back to that inherent meaning and see if there's any historical things or any literary things within the actual writing I itself or any cultural things that might be lost on us because of the time gap. Uh, we had different um, examples of that so far, but we're going to do that with Revelation. So what makes uh, Revelation so difficult to understand? It seems to um, be talking about some things in a way that is disconnected with the rest of Scripture. Make sure I'm spelling this word right because it's, uh, it's an important one. Yeah, so this, this word, the eschaton, we want to define that. And... The eschaton is a big word that kind of means one thing made up of a bunch of things. So the eschaton, eschatology, is the study of the end times, okay? Um, the eschaton would be that event that is the end event. Um, from what we see in the rest of Scripture, which we've talked about that idea of the locus of Scripture, Oftentimes, when we look at Revelation, it seems to be outside of the locus of Scripture. If all the other Scriptures are plotted on a graph up here, it seems like Revelation might be kind of further away. Um, either we focus on it, and it seems to not really say the rest of the Word of God, you know, that doesn't come in line with the rest of the Word of God from the other Scriptures, other Scriptural books, or it's confusing enough that we really don't look to it, okay? But this eschaton event according to the rest of Scripture only, not even taking Revelation into account, um, this is comprised of many different things. Um, it would be the end event where um, Satan is defeated. Okay, so Satan is defeated by God and is um, no longer allowed to go about things the way that he does, and so you, you remove in this end event, he is defeated, and you remove the accuser and the liar who is drumming up a lot of the things that we see um, and is our adversary that's against us. We remove that, okay? You see other things, and these are in no particular order. It's just from the rest of Scripture. The idea of reaping the earth. Um, basically, both God's people and the enemies of God are, are all gathered up, and then they are separated, okay? So you're separating, um, you see this idea of everyone being reaped like you would reap um, a field, and then there's the separating of 
the sheep and goats or wheat and chaff, but the separating of God's people and God's enemies. Um, we see that in, in talked about in the rest of Scripture. We see that in, in many different ways in the Old and New Testament. We're talking about the day of the Lord and the day of the Lord being this thing that a lot of different things happen during. Um, but we see that as a, a, a part of this end event. Again, not necessarily in this order, um, but that's not the important part. This is all happening at the end. Then we see things like um, the final judgment, which is kind of rolled in with the separating of, of everybody, but ev everyone is judged. We see um, the great wedding feast, Christ's bride, the church, coming into um, the forever with God in, in this way that's talked about as a celebratory wedding feast. Okay. Um, basically, you know, for us, communion is a, a little what we what we talk about as a foretaste of the feast to come. Um, so that wedding feast, um, we see actually the physical earth being destroyed in terms of kind of like a renovation. Okay, so if you're going to renovate and you're going to build a new kitchen or you're going to replace your kitchen, a lot of times that looks like starting off with um, sledgehammers and, and completely gutting the place so that you can rebuild. Um, so the destruction of the earth is to uh, renovate, to, to bring about um, the new heaven, new earth that we see in the rest of Scripture. And then along with um, those things, we see uh, another thing that kind of ties in with like the wedding feast, but we call it the great consummation. Or the way Revelation talks about it in, in a lot of cases is the city of God. Um, the thing that we're looking to be with God in the same way that we talk about heaven, we're with God in his presence fully, but the city of God actually in Revelation comes to this new earth. Um, God who left after sin entered the world, the Father, um, he comes in his glory, his throne descends, and the center of the city of God and, and all of his people live together with him and there's no light sources like the sun and moon and things like that because they're not necessary because God himself is the light and the protection and the sustenance of his people. He's all we need is to be in his presence in that city of God with his throne and his presence and his throne room comes to earth. And so these things happen in what we group together as the eschaton. And there's other things that, that we talk about happening and there's other somewhat details and everything else. But to start with Revelation, what we're talking about is a book that's focusing on the time period leading up to this end event, the eschaton. So when I say eschaton, I mean all of the things that all of Scripture collectively talks about happening in the day of the Lord or the, the final event or the end event or the end times and everything, and that is all clumped together in one umbrella term, the eschaton. Okay, so I want to define this so that we can move forward knowing what that means. Okay, now scripture talks about all over the place these things happening with Christ's return, his second coming, the second advent. Um, so the first advent is him coming as a human being and he does his work on earth and he is crucified, he is resurrected, and he ascends to heaven. Okay, and so what is talked about in Revelation in a lot of cases is the time leading up to the eschaton, which is kicked off by Christ's second coming, the, the second advent. And so what we do is 
another term that I want to uh, define what we see in um, Revelation is stuff that's happening in the inter-advent period, which I'll probably write as the IAP. So the inter-advent period would be that time between Christ's first advent and his second advent, the second coming, okay? So basically the time from his life and work and ascension to his second coming. And so the inner advent period would be the time that we are living in. It would also be the time that the scriptures are written in because they are written after um, Christ's ascension and after his work. And so basically everything for the last 2000 plus years is the inter advent period. Um, a key note that I want to, to point out as well is that the inter-advent period is also what is talked about in Scripture as the last days. And this is important for our looking into Revelation because we see Paul say things like he's living in the last days and he is ready for Christ's return and we think he's just totally off on that because in terms of a timeline, Christ didn't return during his physical lifetime, yet he talks about living in the last days. The, in, the interesting thing and the important thing to know is that the last days don't mean the last physical month or two weeks or week or two days before the eschaton. The last days are a synonymous term with the inter-advent period. So Paul is correct in saying that he is living in the last days because he is living after Christ's um, ascension and before Christ's return. And the interesting thing about this inter-advent period and last days is that this is what is covered in Revelation. But Jesus also talks about this time period, okay? So since he's talking about this time period um, and how to treat them, we should let that inform how we interpret Revelation and the content within it. If the last days Jesus says that he doesn't know the timeline for, someone asks him, when is the day of the Lord going to happen? When is the eschaton going to happen? And Jesus himself says, I don't know, the Father knows that. But instead, be ready for it and do what you're told. And what we're told by him is very clear. Love God, love your neighbor. Um, all of the things that we've talked about and all the things that the scripture talks about. And we have the commandments and they're very specific in a lot of cases. And then the Jewish folks at the time of Jesus had some very specific sub commandments and more and more and hundreds of them. And so to test Jesus, someone says, what, you know, what's the greatest commandment? as if you could pick only one um, because their, their whole lives were devoted to doing all of them um, as best they can and rolling the commandments into every aspect of their lives with very specific practices. And Jesus says, love God, love your neighbor, and sums up all of them. And if you do those things, then all the other commandments are, are fulfilled in a sense that when you're doing those things, you're getting to the heart of what the commandments are, which is a guide for us to live the way we ought to live with the creational intent that God had, which is harmony with him and harmony with our neighbor, like in the garden before um, the fall. So if that's the case, then Jesus tells us how to approach these last days, or he tells us how to live in the time after he ascends and before he returns. And that is, like I said, be ready. and keep his commandments or do what he says. So if that's the case, then it's a very specific um, example of Jesus saying, don't sit down and try to break down this timeline and, and picture when um, this is gonna happen and make um, living in the inner advent period a puzzle to crack and try to figure out when it's, this is going to happen. 
because I don't even know when this is going to happen. The Father knows when this is going to happen. If that's Jesus' approach to it, then what we can't do is what we often do with Revelation and try to make it a code or a puzzle to crack to find out when this eschaton is coming. And that's what we'll see a lot of folks doing within the Christian community, especially when we see things like um, the 2020 starting and everything's looking, you know, not too bad for a little bit. And then you have some major, you know, worldwide news and in different things happening. You have the coronavirus outbreak and um, a certain approach to it. The approach changes. Um, it turns into something that none of us have ever experienced before, uh, a total kind of shutdown, social distancing, quarantine thing. So we have disease and famine, if you want to call it that, which we see talked about in Revelation. You move forward to a brief scare with s uh, some murder hornets, just um, Asian giant hornets, um, as if those things are going to come and, and completely wipe out um, you know, all honeybees and things like that, um, totally, you know, attack people in New York City and everything. For a brief amount of time, we saw that. Then you see things um, like people saying that, you know, the, the riots and things are, are a worsening of our, our culture and a destruction of, of order and wars and rumors of wars and things like that. Um, but what we can't do with those things is see them as indicators of us getting closer to this event. It wouldn't make sense to do that given that Jesus already tells us how to do that, so uh, how to, to treat these times, how to, to live in these times. And so that book, this book cannot be uh, a code that we're trying to crack in order to see how close we are to this event. But that's what it turns into a lot of times. Um, so I'll go ahead and give a second here so that you can, if you need to, pause and take down some of these things. So I'm going to need to erase and, and kind of keep going here. Um, but Jesus uh, is talked about when, when the scriptures are, are kind of giving us a, a type of timeline. Jesus' return and his actions with that return and all the things with the eschaton, that is going to kick off the transition from the inter-advent period to the end event, and that event is not necessarily a certain amount of time. We don't know how long it is. We just know the things that will generally happen, and then we'll move into this timeless forever with God, okay? And the, the brunt of what Revelation is dealing with is this time period, but in a very specific way, okay? So I want to clear up some of the confusion surrounding Revelation so that we're not troubled by it, but that we can use it the right way, the way it was intended to be used. And it's important to note that the book is not written only for us today to be able to um, deal with the specific things that we're dealing with since 2020 started. And it's a tough, confusing time, but... It's something that is addressed, but it's not the only thing that's addressed in Revelation, okay? So to begin, I want to define, as far as literarily, some of the context of this book, okay? So the genre of Revelation is actually part of the confusing part. It's an apocalypse, which is a type of prophecy. And it's also, there's three different things rolled in. It is a prophecy, which I'll explain in a second. And it's an epistle, because it's written to seven churches. Okay. Now, you might be wondering why there's three different genres all wrapped up into one. It's never not an epistle. It's not like certain chapters are an epistle and some are an apocalypse. It's always all three, okay? Um, we're going to define apocalypse because that's part of the confusing aspect of Revelation. But 
why is it an apocalypse, which is a type of prophecy, and a prophecy? It's a prophecy because what it prophesies, what it tells about, is actually true. Okay, so we can have apocalypse literature, and we do, and we found some, and we have those to go back and consult and read that aren't scripture, and so they prophesy something, but those prophecies might not come true, might not be actually what's going to happen in the future, and so therefore they're an apocalypse by genre, but they're not a prophecy because it's not going to happen, okay? Now, because it's an apocalypse because of the nature of it, and it's a prophecy because what it says is true, and it's epistle because it's written to um, seven churches, we have to always think of it in terms of all these things, okay? I can't get into all the details about this stuff, but if you do have specific questions, um, please reach out on uh, Facebook or in the comment section of Facebook or YouTube or wherever you're seeing the video because I'd be happy to kind of fill in some blanks and things because we just there's so much here that we can't really get into the details of all of it. But what I would like to do is further define an apocalypse as a genre because that points out some key features of Revelation that, with the knowledge of those, changes how we interpret it, okay? Given that these are genres that Revelation is, we actually need to focus on Apocalypse a little bit more because we are not familiar with it anymore. No one really writes in it an apocalyptic genre anymore, okay? So, um, if you want to think in terms of genre of music, how do you know a country song is a country song and not a rap song or a classical um, score or something like that? How do you know a country song is not a Vivaldi song or um, a Beethoven song? Because when you listen to it, you hear things that by nature, you understand to be that genre. Essentially, it's kind of a funny definition, but a country song is a country song because of the way that it is. Sounds like an odd thing, but you know what I'm talking about if you listen to any type of music. Um, if I was to say, what makes a rap song? It would be hard to sit and define everything about it but you could give some different characteristics of a rap song or what makes a country song. Um, we can't sit down and say it's got to hit these 18 markers in order to be a country song, but you can tell a country song when you hear it. That is essentially what's going on here with the apocalyptic genre of Revelation. Why is it an apocalypse? Well, we found other apocalyptic writing, which was very common at the time that John wrote Revelation. It's a very common thing to have been used to make a certain point in a certain way with a certain genre. If that's the case, then now knowing what apocalyptic literature is, because we've found some and we can compare, we know that this is an apocalypse by the nature of it. However, we also know it's an apocalypse because of the fact that Revelation 1.1, which says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, that word in Greek is actually, this is the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. So the very title of the book, the word that we pull out to make the title, Revelation, is actually synonymous with and is used for and is a, a, apocalypse. Okay, so it's actually defined for us very plainly by John. However, when we read it and understand what's going on and the, the types of literary things that he's using and the approach that he has and what he includes in the symbols of beasts and dragons and other things like that, um, the numbers that are very symbolic that are used, like 7 and 4 and 12 and 1,000, all of those things scream, this is an apocalypse. And if we can become more familiar with it, we can understand that, yes, it's an apocalypse, and that limits how we can pull truth from it. Um, if you were to listen to a country song and say, 
hmm, where are the violins or um, where are the oboes? I, I don't understand why there are no oboes here. It's not something that we would say because largely country music doesn't utilize much of those types of classical orchestra um, instruments, okay? So when we're looking at Revelation in the wrong way, we're wondering where things are and why it's saying certain things, and we might be pulling the complete wrong um, meaning from it, and a lot of times that's because we're not understanding its genre, okay? So I want to talk a little bit about the specifics of what an apocalypse is in terms of the type of prophecy. Um, first of all, it's a very highly symbolic type of prophecy, okay? And that means something. Um, a lot of times we, we would approach it and it says that there's a thousand years of Satan being bound for a very specific thing from Revelation. Um, in fact, because of its apocalyptic genre and the highly symbolic nature of numbers, the number 1000 actually means it's such a great multitude of years or such a great multitude of people or such a great multitude of money or whatever that thousand is attached to within an apocalypse, don't bother counting it. It's an uncountable number. So when we read a thousand years and we might say, well, we're going to take the Bible literally and say that this has to be 1,000 years and nothing else. If we do that, we are probably reading this book wrong accidentally by not understanding its genre. It is by nature highly symbolic, and the symbolism of 1,000 is a very specific symbolism. Don't bother counting. It's the same word that we might use today for how many bugs are out right now. It's getting into summer, it's very hot. How many bugs were out there? And you say a gazillion. A gazillion is not necessarily a number. It means, I don't know, and don't bother trying to count them. They're everywhere, okay? So if that's the type of prophecy that it is, that it's highly symbolic, then we need to keep that in mind whenever we're seeing the symbols and, and try to get back to what did those symbols mean to those people, okay? So very specifically, uh, an apocalypse doesn't allow us to try to think of something like the beast coming out of the sea or the beast on land and those things as being actual beasts that we'll have to try to shield our children from, like it's Godzilla or something. They're very symbolic, but if we understand what the beast symbolizes, then we can get back to the meaning of what the book is telling us. And we'll find that it is a prophecy. Why do we know it's a prophecy? Because what it says is true, and very specifically, when we start to understand the symbols in terms of it being an apocalypse and what those meanings were, we'll find that, wow, this is what happened, is happening, and will happen, and we'll see that, yes, this is a prophecy because it's already been coming true, and it's going to continue to function that way, okay? Um, now, because an apocalypse is a dead genre, again, it's confusing, and since it's highly symbolic and already confusing, but then the symbols are we don't know what to do with, um, we need to kind of make a transition into this um, kind of practical nature of how to take this uh, information and apply it to our reading, okay? So an apocalypse is highly symbolic, but it also is... Um, a message brought from what we would call the higher realm. So essentially it's it's what it's dealing with symbolically is higher truth brought from the throne room of God by a messenger to someone who is receiving the message. John, in this case, by Jesus, by God, in uh, the throne room, brought by a messenger, and in terms of the, the message being brought, if it's from a higher realm, if it's from heaven, if it's from God, then it's dealing with true things, and it's also going to speak about those true things in a highly symbolic way, okay? Now, the highly symbolic 
way that it's brought to the messenger um, is through dreamlike visions. And this is important too because we actually see John talk about it in this way. But think about how a dream functions. Again, this is a review for some of y'all, but think about how a dream functions. If you're dreaming that you are in a, an impossible situation, you're not questioning why that situation is playing out. You're trying to figure out how you can get through that situation, not why it's happening, not why these impossible things are happening. If your dream is that you can fly, the focus of your dream might not be how am I flying as much as how do I now roll into my reality the ability to fly. Um, the same way that that is the case, you might be, the example I gave before, you might be sitting around um, the Thanksgiving table with your family and then next thing you know you're with a group of friends at the beach. If that's the case, you didn't necessarily get in the car and travel for three to eight hours to get to the beach, you're just there. And you're not questioning how you got there as much as you are in the moment and taking in the meaning of things around you. You can transition from Thanksgiving, which is, is not often a time where you're you know playing in the sand at that time of year for us. You can go from Thanksgiving with your family to the beach and in the sand and warm, sunny summer time in the water. And the transition of time and distance is not a question. That is how these dreamlike visions are going to be functioning with the symbolic um, nature of the message coming and brought from a higher truth. So we focus on what the symbols are, are um, the higher truth behind the symbols. But what we can't do with dreamlike visions is then say, well, now we're going to plot these down as a timeline. Um, the way one scholar put it, we can't actually treat Revelation as um, history in advance or as a video of the future. This is exactly what's going to happen in frame by frame pictures that we watch all together as a video. Um, instead, we're focusing on the higher truths from the higher realm and the meaning of those, and they're delivered in a highly symbolic way that when we transition from one time frame to another, we don't wonder how we got to this other thing. We wonder what is the meaning between these things and how do they apply in general to us, okay? Um, and so that is what we need to know about an apocalypse because it has very specific things for us. I do need to point out another, um, another key aspect of this because it is going to help us see the main point I want to make as far as today, okay? Um, since the genre does not allow Um, I'll call it a video of the future. Type of reading, okay? Since the genre itself doesn't allow a, a video of the future or a timeline, so essentially that chapter three is early in history or early in the lead up to the eschaton or something like that and therefore chapter 20 is after all of those things the genre doesn't allow that and since the genre does not allow that kind of an approach history in advance or a video of the future um, we have to see what is going on here and that is we need to focus on Parallelism, progressive parallelism, okay? 
I want to define progressive parallelism because that is, I think, very clearly, in my opinion, what is happening in the book. And it means we read it totally different than if it wasn't this. If it was a video of the future, if it was history in advance, if it was a frame-by-frame -frame narrative in chronological order, then we have to read it in a certain way. If it's not, then we must see what's going on here. Okay, and progressive parallelism is repeating the same event or events in increasing detail. Okay, the best example I've heard, again, from a, a scholar that works with Revelation and this approach to Revelation quite a bit, is um, a football replay. And if you're not a sports fan, then we'll, I think it still can apply if we understand what's going on. Oftentimes in a replay review, we'll have the um, officials try to look at when a knee or other major body part is on the ground, then the person is down, the play is over. When the play is over, wherever the ball is on the field, that is where the ball is put for the next play. So whether that's trying to get a first down so that you go from third down to four more tries, or whether that is crossing the goal line. And any part of the football has to cross the goal line in order to be a touchdown. If you're not sure whether the knee of the player carrying the ball hit the ground before a part of the ball crossed the goal line, then you're not sure whether it's second or third or fourth down and a little bit to go to score a touchdown, or you're not sure if it is a touchdown and therefore you come in to kick the extra point and the other team's going to get the ball. Okay. If that's the case and you're not sure whether the knee hit first or the ball crossed the goal line first, what you're going to do is you're going to watch replays of it to try to determine which happened first. Okay. Um, when this is happening, basically, you oftentimes have progressive parallelism. You're watching a replay of this, and you might say, we see the knee is down here. However, there's a defender in the way from this angle of the replay. So let's switch to a different camera. And you watch the same play. You're not watching a second play. You're watching the same play, but you're watching it from a different angle, and there's more information. And you might say, well, now we see that the ball crosses the goal line right now, but we can't see the knee of the player because one of his teammates is there blocking for him. And so you try to keep moving to other angles until you find one that gives you all the information you need is very similar to what's going on here. In the same way that in any of those different replay angles, you're not watching a brand new play, you're watching the same play over and over again, Revelation is actually a series of replays of what life is like in the inter-advent period and the eschaton, that thing that we defined as the whole group of all of the things about to happen at the end event. Okay, so like a football replay, you have the same play over and over, and with Revelation and the progressive parallelism there, you have the same um, inter-advent period. and eschaton um, over and over. Okay, now that is significant because you do have multiple different versions of angles of the same play. You have multiple different viewpoints with more information or different information each time and that is the same thing we see going on in Revelation as well. Um, we see
new angles with the football replay and that is um, new perspectives um, in Revelation and it actually even though it doesn't necessarily have to happen this way for football again we have increasing detail with Revelation you might actually have to go through six or seven or eight different angles of a, a replay play in order to see a good simultaneous um, angle of both the knee and the ball at the same time you might have to go through that what we see in Revelation is seven different sections and when they start to get into the visions of things which again are highly symbolic visions but are actually true in what they're symbolizing the the ideas behind it and even the events behind it um, there will be a beast who comes in and abuses uh, the surround his surroundings um, but that beast isn't going to be a literal beast it's going to be something else and we'll look at the details of that and we'll see that yes that's exactly what we see happening this is a prophecy which is true um, with the new angles there may be increasing information each time until we have the information we need but that's definitely what we have in uh, Revelation we have new perspectives with more increasing details now this is important um, I'll try to write it down here so I don't have to erase all of this yet. But this is important because if we have new perspectives of the same play with increasing detail, but if, I'm going to try to do this, we accidentally read it chronologically, then we will see things getting worse and worse until the eschaton, until the end, okay? And I hope that this is clear on, on even just logically why this is the case if we do read it as a video of the future however that's not allowed with the genre but if we do then what we're gonna see is things are getting worse and worse people are getting worse and worse the culture is getting worse and worse it's not like it was before it's worse than my parents generation or something like that but we can't see it that way because it's actually progressive parallelism, so it's going to progress in detail. It's going to talk about the same end event. If we're talking about one of those end events as the destruction of Satan and the battle that we think of as Armageddon, we do see that text that we pull the idea of Armageddon from come later in the, the book. And so we would try to chronologically plot ourselves somewhere in between that, um, before that, and in between some of the earlier things, if it's chronologically read. But it can't be chronologically read because the genre doesn't allow for it. Instead, what we need to see is we see Satan being defeated earlier in the book. We do see that. But we see it in the greatest detail toward the end of the book in one of the later replays and there's a lot of detail about that bad battle and the bad aspects of God needing to destroy his enemies. But we don't see it the very last because the last replay is going to focus on the good things, the city of God descending, the great consummation, um, and all those things. So we're, we're going to see that these, se these seven different replays are actually talking about things in increasing detail. And that is an important point I want to point out, especially with where we are today in culture. Um, I said last week in my sermon, I'm not downplaying how tough things are for us as a nation right now, but think of 1968 in America. We had um, 
the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and riots and um, the Vietnam War escalating and our troops being attacked um, pretty aggressively and things like that, all, all of those things happening. And so it was very much the same idea. And that is what Revelation is talking about. Expect these things to be happening. That is how the symbols function. So again, I'll give a second to, to take this kind of stuff down so I can erase and um, make the next couple points. But we cannot accidentally read it chronologically because that would give us the impression that things are getting worse and worse. You can make the argument that from France and England shooting arrows back and forth at each other to our ability now of in the Cold War, the United States and Soviet Russia pointing um, nuclear weapons at each other that could destroy the entire Earth as things getting worse. Well, our capabilities of destroying each other have gotten better, but both are talking about the same thing. You only shoot an arrow or a nuclear warhead intercontinental ballistic missile at your enemy, whether it's an arrow, arrow or an ICBM, the same idea is behind both hatred for your neighbor and not doing what God ha would intend us to do. The kingdom of this world really breaking us down and, and, and the, the accuser and the liar and the adversary causing strife amongst people who are supposed to be in harmony. So yes, we have more capability for destroying our neighbor today, but that doesn't mean things are worse because at the heart, they're just exactly the same. You're going to see wars and you're going to see strife. Capabilities are greater of destroying your, your enemies, but you still have the same strife and, and war tendencies and hatred for one another that is driving both. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, erase this so we can make uh, the next point here. And if we're going to read everything, not as history in advance, and so therefore not as getting worse and worse, what we should do is focus on this nature of this type of prophet, prophetic writing in Apocalypse. And if we focus on what the symbols are, and that it's highly symbolic so it can't be chronological, it's describing um, very specifically um, life in general in the entire interadvent period. Okay, if that's the case, and it's describing all of life in the interadvent period, then what we see symbolically given to us we'll see behind that symbol is a higher truth, and then behind that is either a warning um, for us not to, to treat something a certain way or a situation a certain way, or a comfort behind it, and the comfort is most likely going to fo focus on glory of Christ, the power of Christ, his position, and how he is still in control. And so what we need to do with this, if these things are talking about whether it's famine or um, war or strife or whatever it is that Revelation brings up, it's going to focus on Christ's glory, God is in control, and it's a warning. to remain or to switch allegiance. Now, I think that's how you spell allegiance. To God's side or to the kingdom of God. as opposed to the kingdom of the world. 
And so what we do see here is this general battle of good against evil. And what's important is that all the symbols that we see talking about this battle of good and evil, it's not a chess match. It's not a game. It's not um, a real fight. You see, even with Armageddon, if you really want to, to look into that, which, you know, take the things with a grain of salt until I can go further and, and explain a little bit better the symbolism. But if you look at the actual battle, it's all of the kingdoms of this world that are have pledged allegiance to the kingdom of Satan or the worldly kingdom and are against God and they all gather to battle and then when the battle starts it's like and God defeats them it's like quick there's never any sense from revelation of God not being completely in control it's more of a gathering of God's enemies who are then just soundly defeated and totally destroyed it's not and then they took the higher ground and God was really hoping not to lose. It's never saying that. It's always driving home that God is in control, that Christ is glorified and that Christ is full of authority and, and is the one who came to serve us and die for us, but is also the one who's got all the, the power in the universe. Um, so we need to remember these things and those things are easier to see when we use the apocalypse nature, the apocalypse genre, and what it means to read into the book that this is just a series of replays of the same events. Therefore, what you'll see is riots and burning of Rome and Christians being persecuted and riots in other countries at other times and riots in 2020 in the United States. It's what is behind that that is the question. It's not, wow, our riots are so much worse than Rome's riots. It's getting com com, um, completely out of hand. It's getting worse and worse. And we are now T minus 30 days from the eschaton. That is not how the book is supposed to function. In fact, it's supposed to function by giving us these truths to hold on to and be comforted. Or if we find ourselves not functioning in the right way, it's warning us of actually that's how the other kingdom functions and if you are doing those things you need to remember what kingdom you're a part of and you need to to act like a citizen of that kingdom and it corrects us and I think that's a great thing that Revelation does is because Revelation is now becoming scripture again for us in all the ways that scripture, sh scripture should function that we've already talked about it's something that can correct us and guide us and tell us that we're wrong. It's something that can comfort us when we're feeling like the things we're seeing on the news are out of hand. It's something that can glorify Christ and remind us of who he is. And it's something that, that reminds us that God's in control and that we are on the winning side. That's scripture. That's what revelation is. It's not a confusing puzzle that kind of undermines everything we were told by Christ. If we let it undermine it, if we read it chronologically and we let it undermine our faith, it can look a lot like, well, Jesus says that he has done this work and that if God did this work for us and he's the one who purchased it for us and gave it to us and nothing can take it away from us, then we read Revelation and we start thinking, I got to be careful and try to figure out what the mark of the beast is so I don't accidentally receive the mark of the beast and all of a sudden that little mark of the beast or whatever totally strips me of my salvation and I find myself being destroyed by God at the end. How is that in line with what the rest of scripture says, that God is in control and that God has gone to great lengths to ensure your future forever with him? We cannot let um, Revelation function in that way. Instead, what we see is it backs up the truths of Scripture. It backs up that God is in control and that Christ has purchased this stuff for us and that he was the only one who could do it. And instead of using his power to remain in glory on his throne, he used his power to come and serve us and do it and do the things that it took for us to be with him, even though those things meant dying, even though it meant the impossible thing of God becoming a human being and dying at the hands of sinners, for sinners, that's exactly what happened. And Revelation backs that up, okay? Now, if we're not going to read it as a timeline, and I, I understand that this is going kind of a little bit longer, but I want to make some points so we can really dig into some specifics. 
um, because it is a progressive parallelism, which I will give some examples of next time. So I want you to keep that idea in your mind. I'll give examples of how chapters even four, five, six, and seven are talking about events and things that can only happen at the end of all time. There's no place in a chronological reading for those things to happen in, verse, in chapters 6 and 7 and still have more things to talk about because that's the end. So we'll go back through and we'll prove that actually this is talking about a series of replays of the same event. But what I want to do is just for terms of maybe offering a little bit of um, the comfort and that we have in knowing that we we are in God's kingdom and that we in remaining in God's kingdom and functioning in God's kingdom that is our job that our remaining in God's kingdom isn't up to us or our actions that Christ's glory and everything that he has achieved is has come after the things that were necessary for us to be saved if those things have happened for us and God has given that to us as a great gift nothing that revelation highlights nothing that you see on the news is going to change that but we do have a responsibility to be good citizens of the kingdom of God. Again, we are dealing with um, we are dealing with a battle of good versus evil. So I want to highlight that just so that by the end of this study, before we get into some more specifics about the timeline and things that are talked about in the progressive parallelism and, and other symbolic things to back up these ideas. I, I want to show here quickly that we are dealing with um, the battle of the kingdom of God against the kingdom of uh, the world. Okay. Um, in order to kind of show that this is what's going on, I want to um, just point out a few things that are a little scattered, but I, I, I need them to be a part of this conversation at this point. Okay. Um, the inner advent period, the beginning of that is to toward the beginning of it is the binding of Satan, okay? Um, the binding of Satan isn't something that happens shortly before in chronological form, which is not the right way to read it. Um, the binding of Satan is very clearly uh, happens at the cross. That's when we move from the kingdom of the world having the upper hand to the kingdom of God having the upper hand even though we're not totally realizing the kingdom and there's not total victory until the end of the inner advent period and the, and the eschaton okay um, the kingdom of God against the kingdom of the world it does end up talking about Satan being bound and that binding of Satan is not something that comes to happen again there's a thousand years of it and so the only event that we know of from the rest of scripture that talks about Satan being handicapped afterward is the cross. So the binding of Satan and the thousand years of Satan's being bound is actually too many years to count. And so it's not some future literal thousand years. It is actually the thousand years, the too many years to count, which is a synonym of the last days or the inner advent period. So Satan is bound during this time. How is he bound? It doesn't matter what chess move he tries to make, he can never win. There are no more moves he can do to win. There never were, but we have already realized uh, the kingdom of God is established on earth, though it's not fully realized now. We have already established it on earth through the cross. Okay? So Satan's binding actually means a couple of things according to Revelation. He's totally confined to earth 
whereas before it actually says that he is able to somehow in the heavenly realms and the non-earthly realm in the non-earthly realm he's somehow able to function i think we do see that in job what business does satan have in going into god's throne room and and accusing job but we do see that there and i don't think that that's theologically an issue when we realize that at the cross satan is cast down to earth and is only functioning here if that's the case he's totally confined to earth and because of that he is enraged and what it talks about very symbolically and I'll give some specifics so that we can point out where this is coming from and stuff I just want to get these ideas out for now because he's enraged and confined here it makes sense that he is going to take out that rage that hatred for God hatred for Christ and God's image on those who bear God's image on earth okay that's the church and so we see Satan against the church or Satan against Christ and Satan against the church but oftentimes the way that the book lays it out is that you have the kingdom of this world which is made up of the physical things that we see around us the systems the governments and things like that and they are serving Satan whether they know it or not by terms just by nature of not being a part of the kingdom of God and so what we see is that Satan is attacking us now the church now because he's confined here and he's angry and he's going to take out his wrath on us and though he can't win the war revelation does describe him as a, a formidable adversary if you want to call it that that he does have some power or influence okay since he's totally confined to earth and he's enraged he's going to call to him his servants and this is where we see the beast come in and then we see the second beast which is also later defined as the false prophet okay the beast comes and in um, the different chapters um, kind of in the 12 13 14 range we see Satan functioning on earth and what we actually see Satan doing is calling up a servant and giving the servant all of his authority Satan is called the dragon but he's also clearly defined as and the dragon is Satan so the dragon Satan is calling up his servant the beast and the beast comes and functions in ways that the power of their function is set up against Christ and it kind of is a false messiah and the beast is functioning with the dragon's authority and even the dragon's name and we'll actually see that what that is very closely mirroring is how God has sent his son his Messiah to function with God's bearing God's name and with God's authority okay in a mirror type of form you see Satan sending his servant the beast and then functioning with the dragon's authority or Satan's authority we'll see what the beast does and when the beast functions we'll see that the beast is very clearly not something coming in the future or one person or something like that it is symbolic of the entire inter-advent period and world government that is set up against God now the scary thing is sometimes most times God functions out in the open in the light in truth and Satan functions with lies and deceptions and so sometimes the world governments that are set up against God that are functioning as the beast aren't even trying to do that they're just doing it by nature and 
you'll see that the church starts to take some flack and is hated for what the church says and the gospel that it gives and takes to the world. Why does the world, the governmental systems, if you want to call it that, and the, the function of the whole systematic world all as one, why does it hate the church and the message of the church? Because it's by nature functioning with the dragon's authority, Satan's authority, and so we'll see the world hating the church, which is mirroring Satan hating Christ and, and hating God. Okay? And then you see this other beast come in, and the other beast points back to back to the beast and it glorifies the beast and it calls people to the beast and it functions in a way that helps people to look to the beast as their messiah um, and it kind of props up the beast And if you think about what the Holy Spirit does, is it calls people to God. It gives faith, the, the Holy Spirit, He gives faith to us and points back to Christ and leads us to Christ. And the false prophet does the same thing. Now, if the beast is world government, it's most likely the, the common um, kind of scholarly opinion of the false prophecies would be basically any worldview or um, philosophical approach to everything that tries to find its answers in the world system. Mm -hmm. That it says, well, what we need is more government, or what we need is, and I'm not saying, you know, modern American, big government, small government. That's not what we're talking about. But it's the, the ways of thinking and the ideas that say what we need is answers from here. And that's the problem with what you're going to see on the news is that it's either going to be a right-leaning answer from this kingdom or it's going to be a left-leaning answer from this kingdom and therefore both are doomed and both are going to for some in some way point us back to the beast as our Messiah, as our Savior, as what we need. If the beast functions the way that the beast does laid out in Revelation, we're going to see false Messiah, false Savior, and it's going to be the world trying to answer the questions of what's plaguing us with more answers from the world. And so if you see what we've laid out here and how it mirrors God, these things are The unholy trinity. It's Satan trying to, in his deep hatred for God, trying to steal the authority and mock God and God's trinitarian way of saving the world, of God the Father having the plan and sending the Son, and the Son doing the work, and then the Spirit enabling the Church and, and the, the continued mission within the Trinitarian nature of God. Satan is trying to set himself up with this along with the world systems that we can kind of put together and group into human beings coming together, gathering power, ruling themselves, and turning their back on the Kingdom of God. Government for lack of a better umbrella term. So with Satan being served by earthly governments that have turned their back on God or collections, states, cities, collections of people turning their back on God but still wielding power in terms of earthly power and then along with philosophical approaches or worldviews that find answers in these two we have an unholy trinity. That's very plainly there for us in Revelation. So what do we do with that? How does that help us in what we're seeing happen today? What we need to do is see that with God and His kingdom 
and with Satan trying to give us answers by pointing us to the false messiah and basically most approaches to life and worldview pointing back to we've got this on our own all we need is more people to choose good and then our country will change I'm sorry but the beast is if not serving God if we as a collection of people who are ruling ourselves but realize that God is ruling us and that we are stewards of what he has given us and his power and authority if we're not doing that in this kingdom we are by nature going to be serving the kingdom of the world and so that's why we continue to see over and over and over again world governments abusing people and world governments attacking the kingdom of God. Rome is the beast. Mm, Middle-aged kingdoms that fell far from um, Christianity in the West is the beast. Um, Eastern kingdoms that abuse in the same exact way that the beast does is the beast. Nazi Germany is the beast. China, Russia, anyone today, including the United States, if we turn our back on God's rule and his place as total authority and his laws, love God, love your neighbor, even America can be the beast. Okay, So that's what we need to be remembering. When you see things, don't look for answers to the issues in this kingdom, whether it's on this side that's fighting against this side or this side fighting against this side. If it's in this kingdom, what's happening is it's functioning with the authority of Satan by default and the answers are not going to be there. Okay. So what we would like to see instead is by looking at Revelation, we realize that nothing we're seeing now is new or worse. It's It's life in the inter, inter advent period as promised to us by Revelation. It's promised to us by Revelation, so don't be surprised or run down by it, which is very, very hard to do. I do it too. I can't look at anything, whether it's a sports page or a news page or a music page, without some attention being called back to the upheaval. It's being called to this upheaval because most of the time, if it's not functioning within the kingdom of God and with the kingdom of God as the focus, it's going to be confused and, and the people that we hear are going to be confused and, and at war with each other, but it's also going to be within the kingdom of the world and so we're not going to have hope or answers if it's disconnected from the kingdom of God. Okay. So nothing we see is new or worse. We're not any closer to the eschaton on a timeline as much as we are just seeing what we know we're going to see at this time in these days between Christ leaving and coming back. Okay, So don't let what we see tempt you into saying that we've got to be close now. That's not the worry that we're supposed to have from Revelation. Instead, what we see is that the kingdom of God wins and wins in the end and also is, is the thing that has power to affect change in the meantime. Okay, and so we're the ones that can bring change. And Christ wins in the end. And with that, we're basically free to affect change no matter what the consequences are. The world will hate us. 
if we say yes what the officer did in his actions that led to the murder of the man in Minneapolis that's wrong but if you want to prevent that um, officer from being killed by rioters or something like that then the world today is going to automatically say you are a racist and you are taking his side I want to see justice just as bad as everyone else but the way to do it isn't to function as the kingdom of this world and take vengeance on yourself we have a system uh, of, of system of law that this person should go through in order to be judged and and be judged by the state and hopefully the state will look back to the kingdom of God and the laws that God has given us in order to judge that person unfortunately sometimes the law system functions this way but it doesn't change the fact that God is in control and in authority and so we don't take matters into our own hands but think about it if you were to say no it's not right to um, let the rioters or, or let a group of people take justice into their own hands and kill the man who ended up killing um, a, a person as a police officer killing a person if you were to defend that and say no there's another way to deal with it let's let's have this person go to trial and be convicted if you were to do that a lot of times what we would see is maybe the some of the world the kingdom of this world say you are just as bad as the person who murdered someone you are a racist or you are someone who is um, defending racism it doesn't have to be that way but Jesus says that if we function according to God's laws that we don't just take matters into our own hands that there are some systems that are put in place at a higher authoritative level on earth for us that hopefully are serving God if we defend that and say no it's not right to murder even though this person led to a murder the world is gonna have backlash towards us the world might hate us for that that's what Jesus says the world hating us as Christ's servants and as the church that often doesn't look like just laughing at us for having our Bibles or bringing our Bibles to work or school sometimes it looks like them accusing us of being a part of something that we are no more a part of than they are we just have a different approach according to God's laws that murdering a murderer is doesn't make it right sometimes you're gonna have certain aspects of this kingdom of this world that are gonna hate you for that that is what we're dealing with but remember that we are the ones that can affect change that we can say murder is wrong racism is wrong but the answer to that oftentimes is forgiveness the same forgiveness that we've had that is a very very unpopular thing that we're seeing of uh, an uh, unpopular idea that we're seeing if there's any th talk of forgiveness out there from the church it's deemed as enabling the same evils that we've seen play out already the kingdom of this world is always going to be opposed to the kingdom of God and we don't switch allegiance and we don't give in and we don't murder a murderer we hope that justice is served for that person and we allow God to be the one who gives authority and gives laws and we follow those and that is a good example of these kingdoms being at war what we don't need to do according to Revelation is be surprised by the fierceness of the divide that we see and what we need to do according to Revelation is not look to this same system for answers we know where our answers come from and we need to find them there and we are the ones who must take those answers and take them into this kingdom because our goal is not the defeat of the people that are by nature serving this kingdom our goal is that they switch their allegiance because our inclusion in this kingdom we deserve no more than anyone else that's not in that kingdom right now our goal is that the allegiance that people have to the world system that they are turncoats that they 
leave that system, that they switch allegiance, and that they become part of our kingdom that we have by complete grace, that we are a part of totally because of the goodness of God, that we don't deserve any more than they do. That's our goal. That's what we want to see, okay? So we need to remember these things, and I hope that those are practical enough things, and I hope that what we covered already in laying out um, Revelation, a little bit of the background of Revelation wasn't too confusing or too in-depth or whatever. I realize that this is a long, um, uh, a long thing, but I really wanted to get to, to these ideas. Um, hopefully, if you don't have time to sit down in one sitting and watch this whole thing, that you'll be able to come back to it. Um, that you'll be able to take in all the information. Um, if you're having trouble kind of grasping all this stuff, I realize that sometimes it's pretty in-depth. Please reach out to us. Reach out to me personally. Um, you can call me or text me. You can email me. You can get in touch with the church and they'll get you in touch with me. But I really want to continue these things because I'm pretty passionate about reading Revelation the right way and, and all of a sudden gaining a new book of the Bible and a new take on the Word of God that we've lost, but that's always been there. And now more than ever, it seems like we need that because of what's going on in the world. And when we read Revelation in the right approach, and when we bring out the Word of God in it, we'll see that God knew that these things were going to happen. And they always have been since Christ left. But God has been good enough to give us a guide for these times. And we'll get into some more specifics and more practical things we can pull from Revelation along with some more background so we can make sense and try to prove some of the things that I laid out today. Like I said, timeline and the um, replay angles, the parallelism and things that we see in there. But most importantly, I want you to find that God has given us a gift in this book of comfort for these specific times. That he, with this book, has focused on the fact that the option that we don't go with is trying to find answers in the kingdom of this world. Trying to find answers in ways that we know aren't going to be the ones that affect, that will affect change. But that if we do find our answers here, that he has always given us, even when things get as nasty as they're laid out in the book of Revelation symbolically, and as nasty as we see in reality today on the news, even when things are that way, nothing is new, everything is what God said life would be like in the inner advent period, but we know who wins, we know the answers to the things, and we are the ones, the foot soldiers, to take those answers into our culture and affect change. That's an important thing that we need to do. Don't lose hope, don't be burdened by these things. I realize that's a hard thing to do, but realize instead of uh, you know carrying that burden that we have a good God who has already delivered us from separation and death from him forever and ever and so he will handle this situation what we need to focus on is what role he calls us into in making that happen and making those changes happen and bringing healing and, and peaceable living back to our communities he will call us into those things because he said he would and we are servants of him and he wins and we are not as bad off as the news will want to tell you. And with Revelation and a, and a certain approach to it, we see that God doubles down on those promises that we see in the rest of Scripture and shows us His glory, shows us His goodness, shows us His power, and shows us our role in that. So I hope that you'll return for the, um, for the next one and we can kind of continue to dig into this. I hope this is a practical enough thing that hits you where you are. Um, because that's what we're trying to do, that's what we want to focus on here, using those things that we did with context studies before to really put it um, where the rubber meets the road right now and use this book of Revelation to be a comfort and a warning if we find ourselves not thinking or acting in the way we ought to according to where our allegiance lies and knowing that Christ is glorified, that He has all the authority, that God is good, and we'll continue to look into the specifics of that in the next couple um, weeks. I hope this is a helpful thing. Again, please, any questions or comments, um, take your time with the video, pause it and come back to it if you need to, but any questions or comments along the way, please reach out. I'm passionate about um, coming alongside of all y'all and, and trying to 
illuminate the truth of God in this book, especially during these times. So thank you. Reach out to us with comments and questions, and we'll see you next time.